When the cathedral succumbed to the very power it was meant to drive back, three archdeacons rose through the ranks to help bring their newly found visions of the deep to fruition. Hey there, I'm Jake the Ashen Hollow, and I hope you're all doing fantastically. In this video we'll be talking about the three archdeacons of the deep, and while there isn't too much known about them, I do have a pretty cool idea regarding one of their identities, but we'll save that one for last. It is important to note I'd recommend watching the precursor to this video, my Founding of the Church of the Deep, as well as my Lothric Civil War video, at least the part where I delve into Rosaria's identity. Either way, let's jump on into it. The first Archdeacon that we'll talk about is Royce, the soul of the Deacons of the Deep reads, After Aldrich left for the Boreal Valley, Archdeacon Royce remained in the cathedral with the high priests to keep eternal watch over their master's coffin, which is the extent of what we learn about Royce. When the time came and Aldrich rose from his grave and headed to Anne Orlando, Royce stood guard with a multitude of deacons to keep watch over Aldrich's coffin. Royce is likely also the valued subject that Pontiff Sullivan bestowed the small doll to return to Irithyll with to. And panning over to Irithyll, we find Archdeacon MacDonald in his death-like slumber presiding over the Aldrich faithful, calling upon its servants to steadfastly defend their master inside of the ruined cathedral. Now, I'm not saying McDonnell is the big boned Archdeacon because his name sounds a lot like McDonald's, which is synonymous with being a lardass, but I'm also not saying that that isn't the reason. Anyway, the cleric Candlestick reads, Candlestick used as both sword and catalyst, used for worship by the Deacons of the Deep. The Deacons, under the guidance of Archdeacon McDonnell, became both clergymen and sorcerers. So McDonnell was responsible for the deacons becoming proficient in sorcery, and this likely came after their fall to the deep as doing so was considered a sin, and is probably why they've covered up a lot of the statues of Velka within the cathedral, which we can deduce as Velka after hearing Gail pray to the statue, referencing it as goddess and mother of the forlorn. <laughs> didn't think I could throw Velka in here, did you? But don't worry, I won't linger. The Archdeacon's great staff reads, Large staff bestowed upon archdeacons of the Cathedral of the Deep. The Archdeacon MacDonald's trespass, the sin of channeling faith for sorcery, transformed what was once merely a symbol of ecclesiastic authority into a catalyst for sorceries. We know the power of the sorceries MacDonald learned were from the Deep, as the sorceries were called Deep Soul, Great Deep Soul, and Great Soul Dregs. My guess as to why it was considered a sin would be for one, they obviously fell to the Deep and would forsake their duties, but also miracles and dark souls are quite unlike sorceries. Miracles are the tales of the gods, and require the faith in these tales to cast them. In a way, I suppose it's along the lines of quoting holy scriptures and conjuring them through faith as a weapon or shield. When the archdeacon threw his faith in these tales aside to pursue a different power, in the eyes of his faith he sinned, and as well he turned his symbol of that faith into a catalyst to commit said sin. Though, I doubt MacDonald became a talented sorcerer on his own. Seems more likely that under the tutelage of the already powerful sorcerer and ally Pontiff Sullivan, McDonnell was able to spread the sorceries of the deep throughout the cathedral, at least until he eventually took up residence in Irithyll to head the Aldrich faithful and keep his saint of the deep undisturbed while they found a way to usher in the age of the deep waters. Though we find his body maybe alive, maybe dead, or perhaps somewhere in between deep down below in Irithyll in the water reserves. It is perhaps poetically fit for him as in the cathedral he delighted in the stagnated souls that sank deep down to the lowest depths imaginable and became the shackles that bind this world. Finally, there's Archdeacon Klimt. The St. Biden description reads, A silver Biden decorated by a holy symbol, formerly wielded by St. Klimt. He discarded this weapon that draws upon one's faith on the day that he put his own faith behind him. So much like every other deacon and archdeacon within the Cathedral of the Deep, Klimt put his faith behind him and embraced the Deep. But, Klimt was slightly different, he was both a saint and an archdeacon. But where did his duties land him? The archdeacon's skirt reads, Skirt worn by an archdeacon of the Cathedral of the Deep. Of the archdeacons of the Deep, one attended to Rosaria, mother of rebirth, whom he deemed a goddess. This is the most interesting revelation of any of the archdeacons in my opinion. Serving, at least at some point, Rosaria could have a lot of implications. I have a pretty fun idea about the identity of Klimt, and if you'll humor me to hear it, we'll get to talk about H.P. Lovecraft, and that's cool as shit. Anyways, my idea is that St. Aldrich was formerly St. Klimt, and let me explain how. In researching the etymology of the name Klimt, I discovered that it's derived from the old surname Clemens or Clement. The first recorded use of this name was in the mid-12th century, where a knight simpler of Oxfordshire named William Clement was known as the Church Builder, 
and considering the implications of what Aldrich did when he ruminated upon the fading fire and witnessed the Deep, his visions manifested the Church of the Deep, which I found just a little interesting while entertaining this idea. Next, we think about what it means to serve Rosaria. We know that she's the mother of Rebirth, and thus anyone serving her can very easily become someone else. And to me, that is very much like the time is convoluted argument. Sure, you can use that to say a lot of different things could have happened, but relying on that you can't technically prove me wrong stance isn't enough for me. Which made me think about the name Aldrich, which is very similar to the word Eldritch, which means strange or unnatural, especially in the way that inspires fear. And Eldritch is highly synonymous with the work of H.P. Lovecraft, which we know had a lot of inspiration on the world of Bloodborne, but we didn't really see a lot of that inspiration in the Souls game until we entered the Cathedral of the Deep and learned about Aldrich in the Age of the Deep Seas. And that seems quite heavily Eldritch and Lovecraftian inspired. And if Aldrich was reborn, that could be why his name reflects that. The Rosaria's Fingers Covenant item reads, Sacred Seal of Archdeacon Klimt who served Rosaria, Mother of Rebirth. Rosaria's fingers collect tongues in her name. Some do it to be reborn, others do it to help comfort their voiceless goddess. What's interesting about this is that the design of the seal is Klimt's and not Rosaria's. What's more interesting is that the design looks fairly familiar to and could easily have been inspired by one of the representations of the Elder Sign in the Lovecraftian mythos. In that mythos, this Elder Sign is used as a way to divert attacks from Deep Ones and is described on all the sealed doors of the city of Erlie, which is where Cthulhu dreams. A passage from the Call of Cthulhu says, The Nightmare Corp city of Erlie was built in the measureless eons behind history by the vast Lotham shapes that seeped down from the Dark Stars. So, maybe this could be similar to the way that the soul dregs and dark souls sink down to unimaginable depths and then make up the bedrocks of this world, and that the deacons are beckoning in the age of the deep by trying to awaken some ancient old one that dwells within the sunken deep, kind of like Cthulhu does. But maybe I'm getting a little too excitable and ahead of myself, so let's get back to the Aldrich used to be Klimt idea before looking into more Lovecraft. <gasps> Damn. Wish I would've started this channel when Bloodborne had first came out. The mangrubs we see outside of Rosaria's chambers are likely the close followers of Klimt, even before he began to serve the Mother of Rebirth, as we can see them casting projectiles that represent the Satan Biden that Klimt wielded. When Klimt or Aldrich was granted visions of the Deep is when everything changed, and could be the reason why he wanted to change himself, to perhaps fit the mold of the person he'd envisioned bringing in the Deep, and with Rosaria so readily available, it'd be too easy to do so. Then there's the conflicting arguments about Rosaria's firstborn taking her tongue from her. Does it literally mean firstborn, or is it referencing the first person to become reborn by her? If it is the latter, and Aldrich was the first, then I mean, taking her tongue wouldn't be something out of character for him. A guy who literally eats people. And perhaps if so, he did it so that she wouldn't give his old identity away or something. Or maybe it was his first taste of flesh, and what gave him the appetite for it, and bestowed his lust for the joy of luxuriating in his victim's screams. I don't know. That isn't too consequential to this theory at all, but if we're going to bring up Rosaria, then we gotta bring up ideas of who ripped that poor girl's tongue out. The idea of Aldrich using Rebirth to become what he is now is also interesting given the symbolism of how he appears before us in-game and how the mangrubs who have rebirthed too many times appear. They're almost identical in shape, at least. Elongated, grub-like bodies that stretch across the ground and come upwards to a humanoid-like body with two arms and a head. Sure, Aldrich became that way by eating too many men and then devouring Gwendolyn, but the Grubs became that way by being rebirthed too much. So perhaps it's a transformation brought on by indulging yourself and your vices too much, but I think the symbolism between the two is still there. I want to leave this theory with reading a bit longer of a passage from The Call of Cthulhu, and if it doesn't sound like what could have been inspiration for the Deep and Aldrich lore, then you're free to disagree with me. Then, whispered Castro, those first men formed the cult around tall idols which the Great Ones showed them. Idols brought in dim eras from dark stars. That cult would never die till the stars came right again, and the secret priests would take Great Cthulhu from his tomb to revive his subjects and resume his rule of Earth. The time would be easy to know, for then mankind would have become as the Great Old Ones, free and wild and beyond good and evil with laws and morals thrown aside and all men shouting and killing and reveling in joy. Then the liberated old ones would teach them the new ways to shout and kill and revel and enjoy themselves, and all the earth would flame with a holocaust of ecstasy and freedom. Meanwhile, the cult, by appropriate rites, must keep alive the memory of those ancient ways and shadow forth the prophecy of their return. In the elder time, chosen men had talked with the entombed old ones in dreams, but then something happened. 
The great stone city of Erlie with its monoliths and sepulchres had sunk beneath the waves and the deep waters. Full of the one primal mystery through which not even thought can pass had cut off the spectral intercourse. The only other theory I had for Klimt, which is way more boring than all this badass Lovecraft stuff, is that he is the much larger man-grub thing on the bed with Rosaria. My only proof for that is that there are only three types of deacons that we've seen. Small boys, tall boys, and fat boys. Royce was small, McDonald was fat, so maybe probably Klimt was tall, and is why his man-grub is bigger than the others. I don't know though, I like the Cthulhu stuff better. Either way, thank you all so much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you haven't subscribed already, I hope that you will. Be sure to hit that bell icon for notifications for new videos. Follow me on Twitter for reasons, and if you want to support the channel further, check out my Patreon page for how to do so. Links can be found on the screen or in the description below. Thanks again. Peace them out!